All right, as we were talking about a little bit before service started, you know, we had a great time yesterday celebrating Independence Day, celebrating the 4th of July. I hope you all did as well. But, um, you know, it was interesting earlier in the week, I was watching this video on YouTube, and, uh, you know, there's this guy, he goes around off a lot and he'll do man on the street videos, and he'll go and just bring his, his camera and his microphone and just, just, just ask people questions. And what he does, Oftentimes, he'll, he point, he's, what he's doing is he's pointing out the ignorance, just in general, of the American people. He's out in California, and you know, sometimes it's kind of funny, it can make you chuckle, it can make you laugh, but really it's just sad. The level of ignorance of people is, is really bad, and, and the one that he was doing is he was doing one for the 4th of July. He does this a lot with holidays. I've seen it before, where else, you know, He'll just just ask people like, well, what you know, what is the Fourth of July about? And just people have no clue. Why do we celebrate? Uh, I don't know. It's Independence. Well, who who are we breaking away from? He's like, you know, we get answers of people saying that that's when the North beat the South. That's what you know, like, it it is. And you know, it's comical that people would even say that, but it's sad that people would even say that. And there's just this this vast ignorance in this country and, and you know the ignorance and that that lack of knowledge is going to bring us into bondage and you know every year that progresses this country is becoming further and further in bondage the more debt that is accumulated debt is bondage it's slavery the more we just you know think we just print up money you know what what's really happening in this world is that the government's printing up this paper money, but it's not backed by us. This is backed by foreign investors. It's because China and Japan and other countries come in and they buy up our treasury bonds. And this is, you know, and I don't want to get too involved in that. I'm just kind of pointing this out. You know, the bondage is coming and a lot of it comes through ignorance. A lot of it comes through deception because you got, you got evil people in, in high places that they're trying to get rich, they're trying to make a buck, and they're, they're trying to hold their power and maintain their power and, and you know, all the other motivations for the wicked people at the top. But we as a people need to get more educated. We need to hear the truth. Look down in your Bibles at John chapter 8, verse number 30. The Bible reads, As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, when you're ignorant, when, when you don't know, and ignorant just means you don't know something. You know, a lot of people think that ignorant means stupid. No, ignorant doesn't mean stupid. Ignorant means you lack knowledge. You don't understand something. So oftentimes, if I don't know about something, I'll say, forgive my ignorance. You know, if I ask a question about something because I just don't know. So I'm, I'm trying to learn about something. That's what ignorance is. Stupidity is something different. Stupidity could be, you know, and you're still just making some really poor choices and just doing stupid things. But being ignorant is a big problem. And he says here, you know, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Because when you're ignorant, you're going to be brought into bondage. When you're ignorant, people are going to be able to deceive you. When you're ignorant, you're going to be making poor choices and you're going to fall into lots of different types of bondage. Okay, now this country is full of people. I mean, it's just ripe for, for people being put in bondage because when you're stupid and ignorant, when you just don't know these things, you, you don't know anything about history, when you don't know anything about history, you're deemed to repeat history over and over again. That's what happens. It happens all the time. But I've, I've mentioned this in a survey, I think, last week. You know, people these days just think we're so smart because we have these little gadgets. You know, because someone else invented something that, that really is an amazing technolo technological advancement where you can communicate with people real easily and stuff. But people have this group think and they're thinking, well, we're all just so smart. We're all just so intelligent, you know, because we have things like this. No, that doesn't make you smart because someone else invented this. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that they've just gotten real lazy. They've gotten real lackadaisical. They, they, you know, things seem to be going okay for them. So they choose not to get informed about a lot of very important things that you need to get informed about. 
Now, I'm not going to preach today on all of the other political things and, and things that are going on in this world that people should be informed about. I'll leave that up to you. I'm going to preach the Bible this morning on, um, on you know, some truth that's going to help you in many areas of your life. And you may not even realize it oftentimes when you do get into bondage. And that's why you need to learn the truth. People oftentimes will get into bondage without even realizing it. And that's the worst kind of bondage. You start to not even think about it in those terms. You know, people, and, and a pretty simple example is just, you know, oftentimes people can start a habit like smoking or drinking and not even realize that they have become addicted to it. They haven't even realized that they have become a slave to that type of desire, to that type of, of need to have, you know, that next cigarette. They get started casually. Oh, I'm at a party and this is going on. Oh, yeah, my friend. Oh, yeah, I'll take one of those. And it slowly just begins that process. And before they realize it, they're addicted with, and oftentimes without even, even consciously being aware of it. That, that this has become a problem for them and they've become into bondage to some form of addiction, to some, some type of thing. And Jesus tells us here, he says, look, if you continue in my word, then you're going to be my disciples. And he, so, he says, first step is continue in my word. Look, follow me, basically. You'll become his disciples, continue his word, do this stuff, and then you're going to start to know the truth. And then the truth is going to make you free. It says, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed, they were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So what I'm going to be talking about mostly this morning is about sins. Because sin will make... Jesus Christ said himself, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. We are all to one degree or another a servant of sin because we all sin but I'm going to touch on some things maybe today maybe you don't even realize our sins maybe some things you don't even realize you're in bondage to okay so today the, the, the title of my sermon is declare your independence you know the, the, the foundation of this country what we celebrated yesterday for all those ignoramuses that don't have any clue what it's all about they think it's just about barbecue and fireworks and have no concept of what it's about. We, you know, the United States declared their independence from the rule, what they consider to be a tyrannical rule of the British government. Right? July 4th, 1776 was the day that's described as the Declaration of Independence. It was this, this, this document that was written up stating we are declaring our sovereignty. We are declaring our independence from you. We are declaring that we are a separate nation and you are not controlling us anymore. That is what's celebrated on the 4th of July, Independence Day. It's being independent from that rule, independent from that bondage. They had a lot of problems, you know, and there's a lot of reasons you get into about that too, with the taxation and all the other things that, that was, they felt they were bringing them into bondage. And we look at the list of things that they were willing to fight over back then, and we look at the things that are happening today, I think we have it way worse today. I think there's much more bondage going on right now, and the, the revolution is getting ripe. But, I mean, who knows? Hopefully it's not a bloody one like that one was. Nobody wants to shed blood and, and have a lot of war. But um, it is coming because people are being oppressed and there's bondage coming. And, you know, the result of that bondage is the sin that has been going on in this country. has been ramping up. That bondage is going it, to... It, sin always brings bondage. Always. So the more sin that is happening in a, in a country, in a society, in a culture, the more you will be brought into bondage. It's just a result. It's just going to happen. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, you don't have to turn there. 2 Corinthians 3.17 reads, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. God's Holy Spirit will bring liberty. Now how does it do that? Well, it starts off with your salvation right? We are, as a sinner, you are in the bondage of the curse of the law of God. The curse that's going to damn you to an eternity of hell as a punishment for your sins. 
unless you declare your independence from that sin by declaring your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and calling on the name of the Lord to save you and trusting, resting and trusting in Him to save you, you that gets you independent from that curse of the law. That gets you freed from the curse of the law. And it's that knowledge of the truth that saves you. It's the, the truth that comes by the Word of God that will save you and that will make you free. And then the Spirit of the Lord will bring you, will bring you that liberty. Now, Freedom starts with that declaration of independence, with that declaration that you need to make. A declaration is necessary. It's this turning point. It's this point in your life that you've made this solid decision and you're now declaring it. And I'm hoping that you today will be able to come to a point this morning where you can say, I'm going to make a declaration today. I am going to make sure that, that I am getting free from this bondage, from this sin, from whatever it is in your life that, that you are in bondage to. Because look, we all have some kind of bondage. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We need that, that, that point. And look, it's the same thing with salvation, right? There's a point where you say, I'm putting all of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't do it. I'm, I remember for myself, I was done. I, I, I just realized I had it. You know what? I can't do this on my own. I can't make it. I'm not good enough to do it. I need Jesus Christ. I need a Savior. I need him to save me. And there's a point where I called out on the Lord Jesus Christ. And with everybody who gets saved, there's a point that you come to where you are consciously making that decision. You know, I talk to people sometimes and they'll say, well, I've always been a Christian. Well, it's not true. You haven't always been. There has to be a decision that you've made to receive Christ as your Savior. It has to have happened. Now, maybe it happened when you're really young. Maybe it's happened at a point where you, you have a hard time remembering when that happened. Okay. I can accept that, but there still is a point when you do that. There's a point in time where you've decided and you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't believe any of this. Well, I've always been a Christian. I've always been saved. No, you haven't always been saved. There's been a point where you've sinned, and there's been a point where you're headed towards hell. There has to be a point where you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There has to be a point where you make that declaration. 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 15. 2 Corinthians 5.15 reads, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this is, this is talking to people who have already gotten saved. That, after, that they which live, those of us that have Christ, that we have eternal life, should not henceforth live unto themselves. Now, after you're saved, you should not be living just for yourself. I'm just going to live unto myself. I'm just going to do the things that please me, that satisfy me. No, you should be living unto God because he says, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Your old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We need to walk in that newness of life. But we're going to get a little bit more specific. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Turn, turn to Psalm 101. Turn to Psalm 101. Romans 6 has a, has a reference here. I'll just read it for you. It's an important reference because it really goes further explaining how when you sin, you become a servant, you become in bondage. And again, in order for us to make this declaration of our independence from sin, we need to realize that we are in sin and that we are in bondage, more importantly, that that sin brings bondage. I'll just read from you from Romans 6, verse 15 reads, What then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were 
the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. Before you were saved, that sin, that bondage is going to bring you into death and bring you into hell. But after you get saved, you're freed from that bondage. But now you have a choice to make because you can still continue to walk in that, that, that sinful life, which is just going to continue to bring you into bondage. Now, you won't have the bondage of hell to pay the punishment, but you will still be stuck in that. Elizabeth, stop that right now. Close that. You still will be stuck in that bondage. He says in verse 20, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. If you want to continue in sin, if you want to continue going in that, in that, down that road, the end of that is death. It will kill you. I mean, if you just continue to, to lead a sinful lifestyle and not get, not get free from that bondage, that bondage is ultimately going to bring you into death. And I'm not talking about hell. I'm just talking about physical death. Verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Psalm, uh, you're in Psalm 101. Stay there. In Psalm 38, 17. We need, because we need to declare our independence from sin. And one of the ways you do that, Psalm 38, 17 reads, For I am ready to halt and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity I will be sorry for my sin. One of, the, one of the ways to get right with God is when you repent from your sins. When you realize, hey, what I'm doing is wrong. I'm going to declare my iniquity. I'm going to tell God my sins. I'm just going to lay it out for Him. I'm going to acknowledge it. And I'm going to say, God, I have been sinning. This has been part of my life. And I am sorry for this sin. I am sorry for what I've done, dear Lord. I am going to change it. I am going to do what's right from now on. And this is something that ought to be a continual process for us. Because when you do that, you are getting free from that bondage of sin. Now, no one can make you do this. My job this morning, close that right now. My job this morning, go back and sit by your mother. My job this morning is to give you the truth, to show you what the truth is so that you can make the decision, so that you can be made free. But it's up to you if you have, you know, you, everyone's got a sin. I don't know what your sins are and I don't want to know what your sins are. You know for yourself what your sins are, but it's going to be up to you to say, God, I've been sinning. This is wrong. This is something I should not be doing. And I want to get right with you, so I'm going to be sorry for my sins. Now, you're in Psalm 101, right? Because we're talking about some addictions. We're talking about some things that bring you into bondage. And what I'm going to show you this morning from Psalm 101 is regarding even just something you might think it's harmless about uh, television shows, television programs. Because I think about a lot of people, and look, I was this way too. We have this TV show, you're like, you just simply cannot miss. Like, no, i got to see this episode. I have to see this. I have to watch this. I have to see all these episodes, all these programs, every single one. I need to make sure I'm home at this time so I can watch this TV show. Well, you're in bondage, my friend. If you're saying, I have to change my life, I have to do all these other things just to watch this TV program, you're in bondage. Or um, what, maybe it's not some TV series. Maybe it's not some sitcom. Maybe it's some sports, Right? Maybe it's the, the Sunday game. Well, I can't go to church because this game is so important. You know, the Cardinals are playing the Cowboys and I just got to be there for this and I can't come to church today because I don't want to miss a second of it. You're in bondage. To the, you're a slave to, to, that, to that sport or that game when you decide not to do what's right because of some stupid game, some men running around a field throwing a pigskin that is somehow so important that you just have to stop everything else and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship this on, on Sunday instead of go and worship the Lord. 
But look at Psalm 101. This is a great psalm to memorize because there's a lot of truth in here. You know, you say, well, where does the Bible talk about, you know, television? Why, why do you think that's wrong, Pastor Burns? I don't understand. Why do you think it's so wicked? Psalm 101 has a lot of great scripture, a lot of great evidence. And, and when you think about it the right way, when you look at it, you'll be able to see that you can easily apply this to what is being broadcast on pretty much every television program that's, that's out there these days. Psalm 101, look at verse number 2. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. So here we see, we're setting the scene. He says, I'm going to walk within my house with a perfect heart, heart where I live. When I'm walking inside, just inside of these four walls, I am going to have a perfect heart. Right? Verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Has the scene changed? No, he's still talking about being within his house. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now, I don't know about you, but, but let's just look at this verse a little, a little more closely. I hate the work of them that turn aside. What's he talking about? People who turn aside from the truth. right? Those that turn away from God. I hate the work that they do. It shall not cleave to me. Now, who publicly lives these godless lifestyles, people who don't proclaim God, who, who love the, 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 the pleasures of sin, you could see it in the tabloid magazines. It's all of the, the actors and actri actresses in Hollywood, these TV shows. Look, they live a life of sin. They, they're not God-fearing Christians. These people, these actors that are doing their work, right? The work that they do, the acting, the production of these shows that they're doing. David's saying, look, I hate the work of them that turn aside. And when you know anything about these life, the lives of these people, they're the, they're the people that turn aside. They're having, you know, multiple three, four, five marriages, divorces. They're on drugs. They're, you know, you, you start looking at the lifestyles of these people and it's a wicked lifestyle. And I don't even have to go into detail on that. You should know that by now for yourself just by looking at these people that they are godless. They perform in, in you know, all kinds of things on screen that they shouldn't be doing. Even just acting out like adultery and, and all those other ways. Oh, no, no, but that's just this character. Yeah, right. There's a person doing that. You know, these people are married. Most of these people have, have spouses and they're on screen you know, being intimate with another person. Just for the, putting it on display for the public to see. Oh, but I'm in this character. That's not me. Yeah, right. You might, you might be able to fool your spouse. You might be able to fool some other ignorant people, but you're not fooling God. I don't think the rules change for God when you say, oh, I'm pretending to be somebody else. Yeah, imagine me telling my wife, oh, yeah, sorry, I, I was pretending to be someone else and, and I went and slept with another woman. Yeah, right. It's wickedness. And that, but that's what's going on on these, on these TV shows, on these programs. That's what these people are doing and making and justifying their actions by saying, oh, I'm, I'm in character. Well, this is what this, the way the screenplay is written, so I got to do this. It's wickedness. We need to hate, not just not partaking, but we need to hate the work of them that turn aside. That's what, that's what David was saying here in Psalm 101. He's saying, look, I'm not going to set any wicked thing before mine eyes. When these, when these adulterers and adulteresses are doing their thing and doing their work, I'm going to hate the work that they do. It's not going to cleave to me. It's not going to stick to me. I'm not going to watch what they're doing and have, it, and have myself now become defiled and start to put thoughts in my head and start to justify sins the way that they're doing on the, on the TV screen. Look at verse 4. He says, A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. They're wicked. These actors and actresses are wicked people. Verse 5. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. And again, I mean, he's saying I'm not going to allow that. People who have the, this proud heart and this high look and people who think they're better than everybody else. Right? Does that remind you of a celebrity? Verse 6, mine eyes, mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. 
You want someone to look up to? Look at the people who are faithful. That's who you should be looking to and, and, and setting your eyes upon. He says that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. Now, if you have that television, you're bringing things and people and thoughts, all kinds of things into your house. There is so much deceit and lies that are, that are being broadcast. Don't allow them that work deceit to be brought within your house, to dwell within your house. It says, he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. David had integrity. David was able to say, you know what? I'm going to do something better. I'm going to live the righteous way. I'm not going to allow this wicked, the wicked ways of the world to influence me. I'm not going to allow that to come in. It's not going to tarry in my sight. You need to declare your independence from the world, from the wickedness of this world, and, and stop allowing it to brainwash you by coming through that, the, the, the ignorant tube. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. We need to declare our independence from our sins. We need to declare our independence from the world and from the, the brainwashing, from the wickedness that's being broadcast on the airwaves that are coming right into your house. 1 Timothy chapter 5, we also need to declare our independence from laziness and from idleness. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 13 says, And with all they learn to be idle. Idle means they don't do anything. They're not being productive. They're just kind of sitting around doing nothing, wandering about from house to house. <clears throat> and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. We have a lot of people these days, and look, we were just talking about how the, the great technological advances we have today and this ability to communicate. Well, you know what else that's ushered in? the ability for people who are idle to become even more of a tattler and a busybody through social media. Now, ask yourself this question. How often do you just have to check your Facebook page? See if you're in bondage to that. Can you go an hour? Can you go two hours? Can you go a, a whole day? <gasps> I got to check my face. I got to see my status. I got to see if anyone's coming. Look, you don't need to know what's going on in everybody else's life that bad. Okay, you don't. We don't need to just be, be addicted to these things and addicted to watching what are other people doing, what are other people saying, and getting involved in other people's matters. And then you got people, they're writing comments, and you're writing comments back and forth, and then you're getting people getting upset with each other and and talking about, oh, did you see what this person put on Facebook? Did you, you know, you're being a busybody. You're being a tattler. Now, is that something that's promoted in the Bible? Let's read the verse again. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. That is not something that we need to be. Verse, uh, 1 Peter 4.15 reads, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. We ought not to be this busybody. And look, if you're on Facebook all the time, you need to find something more productive to do with your time. We need to watch out for the idleness. Idleness will ruin you. Look, you have so little time. And you know, as the older you get, you're going to start to realize how short your time really is. The older I get, man, I, I just, the time just goes by faster and faster and faster. And I already regret the time that I've wasted in my past, the years and the, even the days and the hours. And it's still a struggle to just, I, you know, make the best use out of your time. Our time is so short here. And God has so much that he wants you to do. 
There's so much that you can, you know, there's so much wealth and, and treasures you can lay up for yourself in heaven. Something you can actually do that will bring you, you know, e you know everlasting um, benefit. As opposed to just numbing your mind down on the things like the video games and, the, and, and these Facebooks and the things that, you know, you're just, just idle, you're just wasting time. It's a waste of time. It brings, it brings nothing, and in many cases, it just brings strife. People end up talking about things they shouldn't be talking about. People end up seeing things you shouldn't be seeing and getting involved in other people's matters. People have, now, for one, people have gotten way too just open with things that need to be private. Okay, and look, the more that you're putting this up in front of you, the, the more apt you are, the more, the more likely you are to start sharing. Oh, all these other people are sharing the same thing. Well, I'm going to start sharing this stuff too. And people are talking about things they ought not to be talking about. There's a lot of things that need to be kept private and personal in your life that shouldn't just be on public display. And, you know, this is coming, people are starting to reap a lot of what they sowed. A lot of younger kids, a lot of younger adults are realizing this now when they go out to try to get a job. Because they post all of their stupidity and ignorance just for the whole world to see. And then they go to get a job and their employer looks up and says, oh, here's their Facebook page. And they see like all the things they've been doing. Wow, I don't want that person working for me. I've seen many, many problems caused by people not understanding how to, how to use these, these tools. Because that's all it is, is a tool. And it's, you know, I'm not going to just say that, that all of Facebook is all evil all the time or anything like that. It's not. I don't believe that. But it's so easy to get wrapped up in the idleness and, and into, the, into the addiction of checking these things. And we need to be able to declare our independence from that and say, look, and, and here's a great test. And, and you know what? I don't care if it's Facebook. I don't care if it's a TV. I don't care. Whatever it is, whatever it is, test yourself. Test yourself and see if you can do it. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go one whole week. One whole week. And if you can't do it, you're in bondage. If you can't go without for a week, you're in bondage. If you just can't do it. You say, you know what? I'm going to try to do this. You're in bondage. You're addicted. And that's not right. Turn if you would to Galatians chapter 1. This will be a shorter sermon this morning. Galatians chapter 1. As a whole, as a church, we need to declare our independence from the lukewarm Christianity and the influence of just the mainstream culture. Because I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be half in, half out. I don't want to just, you know, throw Jesus a bone and, and come to church and just say, okay, yeah, well, that's good enough for me. I, I went to church, I checked it off, and I'm done. That's, that's not who we are. This is a people, we're a people that's zealous to serve the Lord. And you know what? It comes with, it comes with some strife. It comes with, with people that are going to be attacking you. It's not easy, but that's, but that's who we're going to be. We're, we're, we're not going to be sucked into this lazy Christianity. Galatians chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse number 6. The Bible reads, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And look, I'm bringing up this scripture for a reason. Because a lot of people these days, the mainstream Christianity has gotten so soft and so weak and so watered down that they won't even know what to do. Let them be accursed. You say, oh, I can curse anybody. I love everybody. That's the people's mindset today. But look, the Apostle Paul himself in the New Testament in Galatians chapter 1 is saying, look, if anyone's preaching any other gospel to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach 
any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. And these people that are preaching this, you have to repent of your sins and turn over a new leaf and do all these good works to be salvation. Look, they need to be accursed. I'm not going to buddy-buddy up with them and just love them and say, oh, well, they're just a little bit off here. No, they're bringing another gospel. And they need to be accursed. Look at his attitude, the Apostle Paul's attitude in verse number 10. For do I now persuade men or God? And you need to ask yourself that question, do, do I persuade? Am I here to make men happy or am I here to make God happy? Do I persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to serve him. If you're just going to be saying things and doing things to make people happy, to make people comfortable, then you're serving them. You're not, but you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Only when you're speaking the truth. And like you said here, hey, if someone's preaching another gospel, let them be accursed. That's not a nice, that's not a pleasant thing. But it's the truth and what needs to be done in order to serve Christ, sometimes these things have to happen. And we're not going to get swept up in this emotionalism or in this, you know, lukewarm Christianity that just wants to be friends with everybody and never say a negative word and never say anything, you know, that, that, that might make somebody upset. No. We're going we're gonna to preach the truth because the truth is what makes you free. If you're just worried about, about upsetting someone's feelings, you're, you're never going to, you're never going to, to they're never going to get right. That's why, you know, we need to preach on sin because as long as people remain ignorant, and oftentimes, and my wife's a great example of this because she, she did not have any biblical knowledge for like her whole life until, until I started bringing her to church. She didn't know much of anything about the Bible. So there's so many things she didn't even know were sins. She didn't even know were wrong because she was ignorant of them. But... If I would have been like, oh, well, I can't take her to church. I mean, you know, pastor might say something that, that she's doing that would just offend her and that, that she'd get all upset about. Well, that's not going to help her. I mean, yeah, maybe she'll never get upset. But she's still going to be in bondage. She'll still be in bondage to those sins. You have to be able to hear these things. You have to be able to know the truth in order to even have the opportunity to be made free. The truth will make you free, but we, that we need to hear the truth and it needs to be unadulterated. It needs to be unfiltered. It needs to be uncensored. You just need to hear the raw truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes you don't want to hear it. Sometimes you don't like it. You say, well, wait a minute. No, I don't, I don't I like this. I want to keep doing this. Look, declare your independence this morning from whatever the sins are in your life. Get rid of that, bo get that bondage out of your life. Be made free this morning. With all your declarations of independence, though, we need to make sure that we don't get too rebellious because you think of, you know, the Declaration of Independence, that was an act of rebellion, was it not? We think of, in, just in this country, that the people of this country were rebelling against the, the British government. They were in rebellion. But it was a righteous rebellion, right? So... I just want to close with, with this last point, you know, when, when we're making our declarations of becoming more independent, it needs to be in a righteous, a righteous independence from, from, from sin, from wickedness, you know, from things that are keeping us in bondage. But we need to keep the right dependencies. We still need to remain dependent on the things that the Bible says we need to be dependent on. For example, you know, wives need to be dependent on their husbands. You're not supposed to be, you know, declaring your independence and, oh, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. No, be dependent on your husbands. Children need to be dependent on their parents and not just declaring, oh, I'm going to go out, I'm going to live on my own, I'm going to do all this other stuff. Look, and you know what, I don't care if even if you turn 18 you say, no, I'm going to go out on my own, I'm going to declare my independence. The Bible says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. 
it's, it's when you're going to get married is when you leave the house. That's what I believe. I believe you should stay with your parents and stay in that family structure. You know, 18 is in some magical age where all of a sudden, you know, you, you went to bed at 17, you woke up at 18, now all of a sudden, you're just, you just need to leave the house and go do your own thing and be independent. No. When you find a husband or a wife, that's when you are leaving your, your father and your mother. But, um, and lastly, we need to, of course, depend on Christ. The Bible says in, in 1 Peter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. While we struggle to get free from our bondage, the bondage of whatever sin is in our life, you don't have to do it alone. God will help you through your struggles. God will help you to break free from that bondage when you're relying on Him. You're setting your thoughts and your heart upon Him. You're casting your care upon Him. Say, God, I have this sin in my life. And it's a struggle. And I'm under bondage to this sin. God, I know today, I know that this is a sin. I'm recognizing it as such. God, I'm sorry that I've done wrong by you. I'm sorry. I'm going to try to make this right. But God, help me through this. Stay dependent on God. And you stay focused with the right heart and the right attitude. He will make you free from that sin. No sin is too difficult for you to escape the bondage of. Spot rides have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the, the great truth and knowledge that you give us in your words. God, I pray, and it really is my desire that everybody here would have a hunger and a thirst to hear your words, dear God, to know what's right for them in their lives, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just instill this fervent desire of people to want to know more and to want to please you more, dear God, and to do that which is right. God, help us not to have this fleshly attitude and, and cling to these sins and to, to want to stay under this bondage, dear Lord. It's so much better to be free from this sin, dear God. We pray for your spirit the Spirit of the Lord that brings liberty, dear God. We want to be a free people. We want to be a free church, dear Lord. Help us to convert other people to bring that freedom from the bondage of sin into the lives of others, dear Lord. Stir up our spirits. Help us to have that love for other people enough to bring your truth that will make them free, dear God. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.